know that most of what you've seen, read, or heard about Billy the Kid is untrue? My name is Gail Cooper. I'm a medical doctor and forensic psychiatrist. My specialty is murder case consultation for the defense. For 20 years, I've used my expertise to uncover the real Billy the Kid. Researching over 40,000 pages of archival documents and books, I've written the revisionist history. It's shocking, it's liberating, and I've written books demolishing the hoaxes, hijacking the history. My talks will share with you what I've found. Cover-ups, misinformation, and fakery, to use Old West lingo, will bite the dust. This talk exposes William V. Morrison, mastermind of the Billy the Kid imposter hoax of Brushy Bill Roberts. The information is from my book, Cracking the Billy the Kid Imposter Hoax of Brushy Bill Roberts. The Billy the Kid imposter hoax of Brushy Bill Roberts was the brainchild of a salesman named William Vincent Morrison. After failing to get Brushy an attention-grabbing gubernatorial pardon as Billy the Kid, he co-authored the Brushy-backing 1955 book, alias Billy the Kid, written by C.L. Sonishin. Some have excused Morrison as a victim of Brushy Bill's tomfoolery, but he was Brushy's match in glamorizing his own lackluster life by deception. Unlike delusional Brushy, he displayed a sociopathic personality disorder. He seized on Brushy's act as his ticket to fame and fortune. They made a good team, with Brushy convinced he was Billy and Morrison unimpeded by truth. Born on November 26, 1906, in Kaskasia, Illinois, Morrison descended from Ferdinand Maxwell, the unsuccessful brother of larger-than-life Lucian Bonaparte Maxwell, one of the richest men in 19th century territorial New Mexico. That connection to famous Lucian Bonaparte Maxwell made Morrison flaunt his genealogy. It began with a Hugh W. Maxwell, born in 1777 from Dublin, who settled in Kaskaskia and opened a general store. Other local merchants were William Morrison and Pierre Menard. They all prospered and their families intermarried. Pierre Menard became the first lieutenant governor of Illinois. Pierre Menard's daughter, Marie O'Deal, married Hugh Maxwell. Their five children included Lucian Bonaparte and Ferdinand. In 1836, Ferdinand joined a trapping expedition in Colorado, eventually settling in Taos, New Mexico Territory. There, he had an unremarkable career as an Indian agent and founder of a Masonic Lodge. He died in 1879. In contrast, Lucian Bonaparte joined John Freeman's California expedition and amassed a fortune. He settled in New Mexico Territory, where he married Luz Bobian, Taos heiress to the two million acre Bobian Miranda land grant. He consolidated it as the Maxwell land grant by purchasing her siblings' shares, sold it for a fortune, and invested in a bank and railroad. He founded Cimarron, Elizabethtown, and Fort Sumner, where Billy the Kid's history intersected his fame. Ferdinand Maxwell was Morrison's great-great-grandfather. Ferdinand's daughter, Evelyn, married William M. Morrison III, 
Their son, William M. Morrison IV, married Sophie Hartman. Their son, Jared Morrison, married Afra Link, yielding William V. Morrison. This genetic brush with grand Lucian Bonaparte Maxwell apparently fueled William V. Morrison's lust for renown, just as other Old West celebrities sparked Brushy Bill's mania to join the frontier's drama. Morrison's envy showed in false demeaning of Lucian in an April 14, 1951 letter to Billy the Kid historian Robert N. Mullen. Morrison wrote, Lucian Bonaparte Maxwell, born in 1818, trapped and scouted for Fremont, settled on the Cimarron in New Mexico, later became sole owner of the Bobby and Miranda land grant, died in poverty at Fort Sumner, New Mexico. Morrison also had a brush with litigating. Pierre Menard had backed his nephew, Michael S. Menard, in founding Galveston, Texas. Appreciative Michael gifted Pierre with almost 3,000 Texas acres. In 1942, Morrison, with a Menard Maxwell relative, successfully sued to reclaim that acreage for the family. Morrison later inflated this litigating to pose as a lawyer. So, like Brushy Bill, Morrison was an imposter. He impersonated a lawyer. An example is his family history sheet written on January 2, 1942, for membership in the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis. On screen is William V. Morrison's Missouri Historical Society family history sheet in which he lied that his occupation was as a lawyer. Morrison consistently used his lawyer lie. In 1975, for his biography accompanying his papers donated to the Abraham Lincoln Library in Springfield, Illinois, he wrote in the third person, Morrison studied law at St. Louis, eventually receiving his law degree from LaSalle Extension University of Chicago, Illinois. He became a lawyer, practicing in St. Louis, until he moved to Texas, where he continued to work on family genealogy and eventually filed suit, the implication being as the attorney, to recover Menard lands for the family heirs. Historian Donald Klein, for his 1988 question mark unpublished book, Brushy Bill Roberts, I Wasn't Billy the Kid, researched Morrison's calling himself a, quote, graduate non-practicing attorney in his book, alias Billy the Kid. Klein wrote, he never graduated from a constituted law school nor applied to the Bar Association of any state to practice law. St. Louis directories for the years 1940 to 1945 show he listed himself as a sales clerk and a salesman. He arrived in El Paso in 1950 and city directories beginning in that year until his death list him mostly as a salesman. Three listings show him as a bankruptcy liquidator and the final eight years as retired. He also engaged in real estate after retirement. Klein also interviewed Morrison's employers. In mid-1949, in El Paso, Morrison applied to Arthur Graves of Car Parts Depot for a salesman job. Klein wrote, Morrison informed him he was actually a lawyer, and that seemed strange to Mr. Graves that he would trade a high-paying profession for a lowly auto parts salesman job. To match his lawyer impersonation, 
Morrison also gave Graves a different version about meeting Brushy Bill than later appeared in Alias Billy the Kid. He told Graves that Brushy came to see him at his St. Louis office, with legal office implied, about getting a pardon, though his book stated that in 1949 he went to Heiko, Texas, seeking Brushy as a man claiming to be Billy the Kid. It was Arthur Graves who introduced Morrison to his eventual collaborator, C.L. Sonishin, with whom he'd taken a course in El Paso's College of Mines and Metallurgy. That meant in 1950, when Morrison sought a pardon for Brushy Bill with Governor T.J. Mabry as Billy the Kid, he was an auto parts salesman. In fact, that November 30th Clovis News Journal's article on Brushy's pardon failure, titled Mabry Terms Billy Outright Imposter, exposed Morrison as one too. It stated, William B. Morrison is an El Paso salesman. He had previously claimed to be a St. Louis lawyer. Attending Brushy's funeral, Morrison played lawyer for December 30, 1950's Lubbock Morning Avalanche's article titled, Brushy Bill Buried, But Legend That He Was Kid Lives On. It stated, Another mourner was attorney W.V. Morrison of El Paso. The attorney said Brushy Bill did not say he was Billy the Kid until Morrison questioned him. It came up some time ago, said Morrison, when he was running down some land documents. These led the attorney to believe the legendary character and Brushy Bill were the same. From 1954 to 1955, Morrison sold copier machines for J.J. Vance Microfilm Service. From 1960 to 1970, Morrison worked for a Bill Cardin of Dowtrick Realty Company. Bill Cardin told Klein, Morrison made statements to the effect that he was a lawyer. At the time, Morrison also worked as a bankruptcy liquidator. Morrison used stilted legalese of his lawyer impersonation when faking evidence for Brushy. Like in his December 12, 1952 letter to historian Philip J. Rash, he stated, in representing the claim of Billy Roberts, what Morrison pretended was Brushy's name, we could not accept facts that could not be supported with evidence meeting the legal requirements. It was necessary for us to obtain certified copies of the records. Morrison used legalese of certified copies like a bludgeon. For example, in his letter of April 1, 1953, to the clerk of the Dona Ana County District Court, he requested copied records to be certified. In fact, that just meant attesting that the copy was identical to the original. In a rare admission, his April 19, 1954 letter to historian Carl W. Bryan revealed his employment. Morrison wrote, At present, I'm in charge of sales and production of the local microfilm company. Interesting sideline, isn't it? But three months later, in a July 15, 1954 letter to Philip Rash, he reverted to ambiguity, writing, Usually carry your letters in one of my briefcases, but travel light in Mexico. I am representing the microfilm company down there, as well as two companies of my own in Mexico. But Mexico was just a sales outlet for Morrison. 
He signed his letter of November 10th, 1954, to purchasing agent J.C. Carriage in Chihuahua, Mexico as sales manager after demonstrating a printing machine to him. And as sales manager that November 10th, he wrote to an L.D. Gaines of the San Francisco Mines of Mexico Limited, also in Chihuahua, encouraging him to buy a legal size printer. On February 2nd, 1955, contacting a Marion H. Borden connected to the Texas Rangers, Morrison implied being a lawyer, uncovering that Garrett never killed Billy the Kid. But Borden apparently checked him out. On February 9th, confronted Morrison, backtracked, responding, I didn't study law with the intention of practicing. I have never applied for admission to the bar of any state. Morrison used his lawyer impersonation to bully fledgling Billy the Kid writers. One was a Mary Hudson Brothers. On November 10, 1954, the same day he wrote as a salesman to his Mexico customers, he attacked her. He wrote, a friend forwarded to me a copy of Albuquerque Journal, October 17, 1954, wherein appears an article by Nell Campbell stating that you are an authority on Billy the Kid. I must take exceptions to that statement unless sufficient citations can be furnished to prove the contentions in this news article and the false statements made in your little book, Billy the Kid by Hustler Press in 1949. I claim to be an authority on the legal records and the evidence pertaining to the kid, and I can back my claim with legal evidence. I hope that you can do likewise. And Edwin Corley also got his abuse. On July 26, 1953, Corley responded, The answer to your excited letters about my Billy the Kid book can be put into two words, a novel. Corley, believing his partner C.L. Sonishin was more sane, wrote to him, a. Mr. William B. Morrison states that you are his friend. Anyone so emotionally distraught as Mr. Morrison will only become more so if the discussion is prolonged. I have therefore made my reply brief, and I enclose herewith a copy of it for your information. But Sonishin was relying on Morrison's mental aberrations and aggression as cover for his own crass ambitions in developing the brushy bill hoax and merely filed Morrison's letters of raving blather in his collected papers. On August 11, 1953, Morrison continued to harass Corley, writing, I have no intention of shutting up Furthermore, I can define words and phrases, and I can prove up my contentions with competent evidence. Can you? Puffed up with his impending book, Bluffing Morrison blasted opponents. On August 9, 1953, he attacked El Paso Times correspondent Georgia B. Redfield. He wrote, this is to notify you that I have read your false statement that was published in this issue today. Therefore, I hereby make demand for sufficient citations for the legal evidence to support your contention that representations in the pardon petition of 1950 for Billy Roberts were false. New Mexico is probably the only state in which you could qualify as an historian. My research is performed with a tape recorder and a microfilm machine. Furthermore, I have certified copies 
from the court records to prove most of my contentions. Can you say the same thing about your methods of research? On April 11, 1966, Morrison ranted legal-sounding double talk to a Paul Albright of the Associated Press to attack Jarvis Garrett, hated for rejecting Brushy's claim at the pardon hearing. Morrison wrote, It appears that Mr. Patrick F. Garrett, his son Jarvis, and Walter Noble Burns have done more than the other writers to confuse matters on Kidd when all of them had access to the facts and legal records dug out by the undersigned. This referred to his meaningless and ignored evidence packet brought to the pardon hearing, which included his so-called statement of facts, which denied the coroner's jury report, certified copies of real Billy the Kid documents, and fake affidavits that Brushy was Billy. I was engaged to research the legal records in order that a client might be able to litigate his legal right in a court of competent jurisdiction. William B. Morrison's other impersonation was being an historian inflated from his Menard litigation research. His entire Brushy Bill imposter hoax grew from that conceit. On May 21st, he wrote to a William Kimball hyping himself as an historian with a legal bent. He wrote, My literary partner, Sonishin, is a writer of fact and history, which ties in with my theory that history should follow the legal records in any event. Being a member of the Missouri Historical Society, established in 1866 by members of my family, the St. Louis Historical Developments Foundation and local historical societies, I am vitally interested in seeing that true facts are recorded for posterity. Predictably, Morrison was mocked by historians after alias Billy the Kid came out. On May 21, 1955, he wrote pompously to Philip J. Rash, You say you see nothing in what Billy Roberts said that couldn't have been picked up by anyone who had read a book or two or had been around Lincoln. I have talked to expert attorneys on evidence. Frankly, none of them agree with your contention. In fact, Morrison had created the formula for Brushy's Billy the Kid imposter hoax. It was back his fake 20-year age regression, claim special knowledge only Billy could have, claim illiteracy to quash accusations of his reading up, coach him on the history, and take him to see historical sites. In the 1930s, Brushy had likely read some Billy the Kid's sources for impersonating him in Gladewater, Texas. To that, Morrison added massive research and input from Sonishin. On February 9, 1955, he wrote to a Marion H. Borden, Not a stone was left unturned during my investigation in behalf of Billy Roberts in addition to certified copies of the legal records, I have microfilms of all court minute books and most case files pertaining to the kid. Morrison spelled out his special knowledge stratagem in a June 29, 1955 letter to a William Waters. He stated, I do not believe 
that it would have been physically and humanly possible for anyone to have located the information and retained it in his mind over such a great period of time as would have been necessary in Robert's case. Confident of the perfect ruse, Morrison missed its fatal flaws. His day's inadequate sources had telltale errors revealing themselves when parroted by Brushy, and everything depended on Brushy retaining dizzying amounts of information to perform for the pardon hearing experts. Failure was built in. Marson's prompt sources were actually provided in Sonishin's alias Billy the Kid's footnotes with his silly ploy of claiming they independently corroborated Brushy's special knowledge. The quasi-fictional books used were the 1927 edition of Pat Garrett's 1882, The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid, Charles A. Syringo's 1920, The History of Billy the Kid, Walter Noble Burns's 1926, The Saga of Billy the Kid, John W. Poe's 1933, The Death of Billy the Kid, and Sophie Poe's, John Poe's wife's, 1936 Buckboard Days. From early historians like Robert M. Mullen, Maurice Garland Fulton, and Philip J. Rash were lifted some historical names and events. Used was a 1926 letter by Pat Garrett's posse man Jim East about Billy Bonney's capture. There were Billy's contemporaries' autobiographies referencing him, Henry Hoyt's 1929 Frontier Doctor, George Coe's Frontier Fighter, and an A.P. Paco Anaya's recorded old-timer malarkey. For Billy himself, there was his tintype, but Morrison and Brushy didn't know it was right to left reverse, so Brushy faked left-handedness. Also used were Billy's pardon bargain letters with Governor Lou Wallace from the Indiana Historical Society. As Morrison wrote to its librarian, Carolyn Dunn, on October 9, 1950, while at the Lincoln Museum, I copied most of the letters. I am enclosing herewith copies for your assistance in locating the original to be photostatted and certified by your office. The first copies were for coaching. The certified copies were for his fake legal presentation at Brushy's pardon hearing. He also wrote to Lou Wallace Jr., Wallace's grandson, to get a copy of Billy Bonney's first pardon bargain letter. An important part of the trickery was finding esoterica for the special knowledge. For example, Morrison researched Billy's indictments and court cases, so he learned that on April 6, 1881, Billy's indictment for the Andrew Buckshot Roberts killing was quashed, but he missed a quashed for acquitted, so that's what Brushy ended up parroting. In fact, the case was merely set aside as erroneously filed as federal when it was territorial. But Morrison refused to spend $100, about $1,000 today, for the transcript of the Military Court of Inquiry of Lincoln County War Commander N.A.M. Dudley. Thus, he and Brushy missed real Billy's key testimony of witnessing three white soldiers firing a volley at him and others escaping the burning McSween house. On May 21st, 1955, Morrison wrote defensively to Philip Rash, who caught that missing information. I believe that you will agree that less than one millionth of one percent of the readers have read the transcript. It seems peculiar that you are the only one contending to have legal evidence to controvert mine. That was Morrison's bet 
that no reader knew enough history to catch Brushy's fraud, but that was his hoax's vulnerability. One fatal error could bring it down. Morrison's sociopathic rage at being caught flared in his August 21, 1955 letter to Sonichin, in which he called naysayer rash a rat. Because the Secret Service reports of Special Operative Azariah Wild were only discovered decades later, Brushy also lacked his lines for Garrett's tracking and capture of Billy, or Billy's second pardon opportunity. Lincoln, site of the Lincoln County War battle and Billy's jailing, was largely intact, so Morrison toured Brushy there in 1949 for coaching. Also in 1949, Morrison interviewed Lincoln County old-timers for period memories, but lost for trickery was the town of Fort Sumner, including the Maxwell Mansion where Billy was killed, so Brushy was left on his own for wild confabulating. Also available was history's junkyard, old-timer windbags recorded malarkey adding themselves to made-up Billy the Kid history. Morrison and Sonichin relied on them and were too historically ignorant to vet them, so Brushy added their traceable errors as his fake memories. And since Morrison's prompting notes are in Sonichin's collected papers, one can see a fatal error that he created and Brushy parroted that Celsa Gutierrez, as sister of Sabal Gutierrez, was Brushy's Fort Sumner sweetheart when she was actually Sabal's wife, with both coincidentally having the same last name. And Paulita Maxwell was real Billy's lover. Research was just the start of William V. Morrison's gargantuan effort. He knew everything came down to Brushy's Billy the Kid performance. Coaching was key. As it would turn out, Brushy had a bad memory for the history, but Morrison wouldn't realize that until too late. By the November 30th, 1950 pardon hearing, Morrison had been coaching Brushy since their June 1949 meeting. He had exposed him to the sources, made rehearsal tape recordings of his prompting sessions, and had toured him to Lincoln and its courthouse jail. It would take 67 years from Brushy's 1950 death for specifics of Brushy's preparation to be inadvertently revealed. Brushy backing author William Carl W.C. Jameson for his 2012 book titled Billy the Kid, The Lost Interviews, which quoted from transcripts of Morrison's Brushy recordings, related that between the summer of 1949 and December of 1950, Morrison made eight six-inch tape recorder reels of his Brushy interviews. They perplexed Jameson by Brushy's repetitions, though he was obviously rehearsing his lines. The transcripts, largely concealed by Sonichin and alias Billy the Kid, revealed Morrison's leading questions for prompting. As examples, Morrison asks, Tell me what you remember about the incident at the Great House Ranch where Deputy Jimmy Carlisle was shot and killed, a killing that was attributed to you. Or, you rode away and hid out at Stinking Springs then, didn't you? Tell me about the confrontation with Garrett and his posse. One can also picture that at Morrison's tapings, Brushy, who could read and write, was holding the sources he was paraphrasing. An example is from Billy's March 4, 1881 letter to Lou Wallace, in which articulate Billy wrote, 
I have done everything that I promised you I would, and you have done nothing that you promised me. Brushy came up with, I done everything I promised him to do. Jameson also confirmed Brushy's own notes kept in Big Chief writing tablets. Morrison's prompting had been obvious in Brushy's pardon hearing. The reporter for November 30th, 1950, Santa Fe, New Mexican's article, Billy the Kid Only a Phony, it turns out, revealed that when Brushy forgot any sheriff besides William Brady, this interchange occurred. What's his name? Brushy asked, turning to Morrison. Garrett, supplied Morrison. Also left to Morrison was damage control. Ignoring Brushy's implausible age claim, he let Brushy cover with a fake genealogy for his 20-year too young problem, which had made him under two at Billy Bonney's fatal Fort Sumner shooting. Morrison also took on the fatal obstacle of the coroner's jury report of Billy the Kid by a relentless campaign of scams denying its existence. The actual report and Pat Garrett's reward for the killing are covered in talks 36, 37, and 38 in the playlist. Though having copies of the report in the original Spanish and its translation, Morrison and Sonishin variously claimed it was not authentic, was written by Pat Garrett as cover-up for either killing no one or killing an innocent victim, was one of two false reports, was never filed, and was not so-called certified. And they lied that Garrett's reward was not given for lack of it, and that the legislature only awarded it by Santa Fe Ring intervention. That led to lying that its lack proved Billy the Kid had never been killed, so Brushy was surviving Billy the Kid. For his report certification scam, Morrison exaggerated the modern concept of attesting that a copy of a document is its exact duplicate to meaning that a document's content was confirmed as true. Addressing Morrison's scam, historian Maurice Garland Fulton, possibly teasing, got his 1951 copy of the original report certified when he donated it to the Indiana Historical Society. So, Morrison hid that. Fulton also ridiculed the certified baloney in an August 5, 1951 El Paso Times article titled, Coroner's Report Proves Billy the Kid is Dead, historian asserts, researcher discovers document. Fulton was quoted. Morrison's contention that the coroner's report was not recorded, meaning certified, is taking the modern practice rather than the older one. On August 7th, Morrison responded in his stilted legalese to that paper's editor, making up that he needed a certified copy of the report for Brushy's pardon hearing, but couldn't locate it. He ranted, Under our democratic government, accused or convicted persons have the right to ask courts to set aside judgments for legal reasons. Mr. Roberts was advised that it would be necessary to obtain certified copy of verdict rendered in San Miguel County to prepare a petition to set aside the verdict in court action. Due diligence was exercised to obtain certified copy from San Miguel County, but without a veil. Using this report certification scam is Morrison's letter of June 27, 1950, to historian Eugene Cunningham, in which he stated that Garrett's copy of the report given to acting Governor Rich on July 15, 1881, wasn't certified, hiding that certifying wasn't done then. 
Morrison wrote, in recent months, a photostatic copy of the purported original verdict was submitted to substantiate the fact that a bona fide verdict did exist. It was set out in Garrett's report, meaning Garrett's letter to Rich, that he was attaching a copy of the original coroner's verdict. However, it was not a certified copy from the record in San Miguel County aforesaid. Therefore, I feel certain that you are making a reference to a copy of the purported verdict so you can understand my conclusion that a bona fide verdict did not exist. For his report, non-existent scam, Morrison sought it in the wrong place. Written in San Miguel County's Fort Sumner by Justice of the Peace Alejandro Segura, the report itself identified its recipient. Segura began, to the district attorney of the first judicial district of the territory of New Mexico, greetings, close quote. Segura then presented the juryman's identification of William Bonney and Pat Garrett's justification for the reward. Segura concluded, all which information I put at your disposal, your being the district attorney. The district attorney was William Breeden, also attorney general, whose first judicial district office was in Santa Fe. Breeden filed the report with his other San Miguel County court records where it was located in 1932 and 1951. Morrison hid that he knew that. He also hid that he had a November 7, 1949 letter from Maurice Garland Fulton telling where to find the report. Fulton wrote, this would likely mean Santa Fe, which he underlined. San Miguel County was at that time in the first, underlined, judicial district. Instead, Morrison searched in San Miguel County's seat of Las Vegas so as to find nothing. On August 9, 1951, he also requested the report from the district attorney's office in Las Vegas. The obvious response stated, I'm sorry, I cannot comply with your request because of the fact that such a record is not now and never had been among the records of our office. Morrison crystallized his lie to a George Reed on March 19, 1955, a few years ago, while checking the legal records on the kid, it was determined that they never made an official coroner's verdict in the purported killing. For his, the report was fake scam, Morrison claimed the known report was not authentic. This trickery had parts, that there were two reports, with Garrett losing one, then forging another, that Garrett was refused the reward because no report existed to prove victim identity, and that the legislative act granting him the reward was by Santa Fe Ring influence without the report. Morrison and Sonichin had copies of the actual report in Spanish and English translation. On May 2nd, 1951, historian Robert N. Mullen sent Morrison another. Morrison responded with stilted fakery. This will serve to acknowledge the receipt of the transcript copy of the purported coroner verdict in the case of Billy the Kid. Morrison built the hoax's two-report scam with old-timer malarkey by A.P. Paco Anaya, once a Fort Sumner friend of Billy's. It came from Anaya's April 2, 1936 letter to the editor of New Mexico magazine, George Fitzpatrick. Anaya, pretending he'd been on the coroner's jury, wrote, Pat Garrett lost the report that we, the coroner's jury, gave him and he got Mr. Manuel Arreo, that man Peter Maxwell's brother-in-law, 
Manuel Abreu to write him another one. A copy of Anaya's letter is in Sonishin's collected papers proving he and Morrison hid that Anaya had added that he personally identified Garrett's victim as Billy Bonney. Anaya's identification was published posthumously in his 1991 book, I Buried Billy. Morrison, in his letter of March 24, 1951, to historian Robert N. Mullen, used Anaya's to report fiction as fact. He wrote, there was definitely two different purported coroner's verdicts rendered in the killing at Fort Sumner in July 1881, but there was no record, meaning report, made in either event. Therefore, neither one would be legal and valid. Morrison added the refusal of reward scam by misstating acting governor William Rich's July 21st, 1881 executive record book entry about suspending Garrett's rewarding. Morrison pretended suspended meant denying, then made up that denial was for lack of the report confirming victim identity. In fact, Rich had written, Believing that Mr. Garrett has an equitable claim against the territory for said reward, the action at this office will simply be suspended until the case can properly be represented to the next legislative assembly. That meant Rich delayed paying Garrett until the legislature converted Governor Lou Wallace's private reward to a territorial one which it did. The authenticity of the report or victim identity were never issues. Morrison added to his legislature reward scam by misstating its act of February 18, 1882. The act stated, Pat Garrett did, on or about the month of August 1881, in pursuance of the above reward, attempted to arrest said William Bonney and in said attempt did kill said William Bonney at Fort Sumner. Morrison made up that it's using August instead of July meant the July 14th killing never occurred when it was merely that day's legal convention to bracket time as on or about. He and Sonishin then made up that the reward was given by Santa Fe Ring intervention without the coroner's jury report. Marson used that August date scam frequently. An example is his April 12, 1977 letter to a Lawrence K. Mooney stating, certainly the special act of the territorial legislature granting Garrett relief, a reward, for killing the kid in that month of August 1881 did not constitute a legal declaration of death, and they ignored not having a coroner's verdict by changing the date of killing from July 14 to a date in August. Morrison crystallized his coroner's jury report hoax in his March 19, 1955 letter to a George Reed. He wrote, A few years ago, while checking the legal records on the kid, it was determined that they never made an official coroner's verdict in the purported killing. I am of the opinion that Garrett didn't kill anyone at that time. I believe that the kid got away and went into old Mexico. Morrison's next Herculean task was saving the hoax after Brushy Bill failed his November 30th, 1950 pardon hearing with Governor T.J. Mabry. Morrison's lucky break was Brushy's sudden death a month later. He and Sonishin were left free to create a better Brushy. 
So kind artist Morrison rationalized the lost pardon as dead brushies martyred him. He called the hearing an unfair, quote, memory test. On April 9th, 1951, he wrote to a C.G. Killinger, William H. Roberts, alias William H. Bonney, was actually Billy the Kid. We had definite proof, but we were not afforded a legal conference on the evidence. We submitted to a memory test in the presence of the McKinney and Garrett families and the public in general. He did not answer the questions as dictated by historians in a manner to their liking. Therefore, the governor refused to grant a legal conference on the evidence. And salesman Morrison went into a frenzy of promotion. He wrote hundreds of letters advertising Brushy Bill and giving talks replaying his brushy lies to pave the way for alias Billy the Kid, which Sonishin was writing. When its manuscript was done in 1952, Morrison then sought a publisher. He also wanted movie deals, and he shamelessly but futilely barraged historians Philip J. Rash, Robert Mullen, Maurice Garland Fulton, young Frederick Nolan, and William Kelleher with bullying persuasion. An example is his August 18, 1952 threatening attack on William Kelleher, his opponent at the time of the Maybury hearing and an anticipated enemy of his book. He wrote, In my book, I have answered fully regarding your erroneous opinion that Pat Garrett killed Billy the Kid by remarking that it could not have been based upon the facts and records in the matter and that your remarks were improper, untrue, and prejudicial to the legal rights of the petitioner since you are a recognized historian, capitalized, I believe you will follow the records cited in my books in the event you approach the subject of the kid in the future. Salesman Morrison also knew that the ticket to his dreams was C.L. Sonishin, the book Gambit needed, his Harvard Ph.D., even if it was in antique English language, and his familiarity to historians. On December 31, 1950, days after Brushy's death, Morrison wrote to Sonishin, Brushy Bill, parenthesis, Billy the Kid Roberts, died on December 27, 1950, 12.40 o'clock noon, Heiko, Hamilton County, Texas, at the age of 90 years, 11 months, and 27 days. In his fawning letters, Morrison addressed Sonishin as my friend and doc. By December 27, 1951, he and Sonishin signed an agreement for the untitled brushy book. Salesman Morrison also realized his product, Brushy as Billy, was imperiled by new scholarly discoveries, so he did more research for surreptitious fix-ups in alias Billy the Kid. But it was still too early for definitive information on Billy's early years, though Morrison, aware it was Brushy's missing link, badgered historian Philip J. Rash. In a December 12, 1952 letter to him, he wrote defensively, I have no interest in the Bonnie or Antrim families for the reason that those names did not appear in records of heirship of the kid, meaning Brushy. I found no evidence or legal proof that he descended from Mrs. Antrim as her offspring, 
the nearest relationship that I was able to prove was that of Ant, which brush he used. As a historian, I am very much interested in the Antrim and Bonnie families, and I'm anxious to learn the results of your research. He added a nervous lie. I do not believe it will affect my case to a great extent. On December 25th, 1952, Morrison again fished for names from Rash. He wrote, The father may have been McCartney, Antrim, Bonnie, or anything else. I was interested in obtaining a pardon for a man who said he was Billy the Kid. For alias Billy the Kid, Sonishin simply denied McCartney as a name. In a footnote, he wrote, Another story current in Silver City says that Billy the Kid was really named McCartney, M-C-C-A-R-T-N-E-Y. Morrison, by a June 30th, 1954 letter to Rash, updated to faking McCarthy, M-C-C-A-R-T-H-Y, as being in Brushy's repertoire. He wrote, the kid's name could have been Roberts or just about anything else, and still he could have been known as McCarthy. I believe that he did use the name McCarthy in Silver City. Aliases were not too unusual in those times. By June 1, 1955, Morrison wrote to Rash in response to the fatal discovery confirming Billy's actual name as Henry McCarty, M-C-C-A-R-T-Y, in Santa Fe's First Presbyterian Church's March 1, 1873 marriage record of his mother, Catherine McCarty, to William Henry Harrison Antrim. Pretending indifference, Morrison wrote, I am ready to accept your church record as sufficient evidence to close this issue. I had no interest in the record, but I picked it up. It's impossible for me to admit, as you say, that Billy Roberts' early history does have a great bearing on whether he was the kid. So, Morrison was left ridiculously claiming that Brushy's ignorance of Billy's own name was irrelevant to his claim of being Billy. By his letter of April 12, 1977, to a Lawrence K. Mooney, Morrison settled on lying. He wrote, I heard rumors the kid's name was Henry McCarty, but no documentation. Future brushy backing authors merely dispensed with Morrison's rigmarole and forged Brushy's words to insert McCarty name as if he used it. For Morrison, a more natural fit than historian was Huckster. On January 2nd, 1951, he pitched the hoax to Life magazine only six days after Brushy dropped dead. He wrote, I decided to release the records in my file to Life magazine for placing the true facts before the reading public. It is my opinion that Billy the Kid was not killed by Pat Garrett or anyone else. It is also my opinion that William Henry Roberts, alias William Henry Bonney, alias Kid, alias Billy the Kid, alias Brushy Bill Roberts, alias O.L. Roberts, was one and the same person. The pitch failed. On August 8, 1952, Morrison gave a Kiwanis Club talk in Silver City titled, He Said He Was Billy the Kid. It had hoax lies of Brushy's special knowledge and illiteracy, his small hands and big wrists for shackle slipping, no coroner's jury report, and the failed pardon hearing because of intimidation. Morrison even risked using Brushy's faked Silver City life, stating that 
he was there, quote, in 1868 and left in 1871 going to Texas and returning to Silver City in 1874, where his foster mother, Mrs. Antrim, died in the fall. Morrison's Silver City audience missed that Silver City didn't exist in 1868. And Real Billy was there from 1873 to 1875 with his real mother, Catherine Antrim, dying on September 16, 1874. The response convinced conman Morrison that he'd struck gold. On August 15th, he gushed to Sonishin. It was amazing to see their reaction. They want me to visit again, and you must come along. Morrison reran his fakery for a December 3, 1953 El Paso Rotary Club lecture on Billy the Kid, with Sonishin giving his introduction. Morrison stated, During my talk, I hope to dispose of the two purported coroner's verdicts, and I hope to prove, among other things, that the kid was not killed by Garrett or anyone else. The kid lived for many years before appearing and applying for a pardon in 1950, which was refused by Governor Mabry without considering the indisputable records and evidence. Billy Roberts was actually Billy the Kid, as he claimed to be. Morrison concluded, Garrett's posse purportedly killed an unidentified man in July or August, 1881. In fact, there is no legal evidence in San Miguel County to prove that they killed anyone at that time. By March 17, 1954, Morrison, fantasizing big bucks, lied in a letter to historian Carl W. Bryan that, quote, Mr. William Kelleher, the attorney, historian, author in Albuquerque, actually his opponent, has definitely decided that my theory is the correct one. He is accepting my records in the case of Billy the Kid. At present, I am dickering on movie and television rights on my work. He added that he wanted, quote, the opportunity to remove the remains in the Billy the Kid grave for scientific investigation. That failed, but as we'll see in later talks, it became a favored publicity stunt of subsequent Brushy Bill hoaxers. On March 31st, 1954, Morrison learned that he'd failed to hook movie cowboy Gene Autry with his so-called information on Billy the Kid. But a relentless salesman, he wrote again to Autry on his September 10th, stating, our manuscript, alias Billy the Kid, has been accepted for publication by the University of New Mexico Press. I will forward it to you. I take this opportunity to thank you for the consideration given my material. On December 14, 1954, Morrison, in full huckster mode, wrote to alias Billy the Kid's University of New Mexico Press sales manager, lying outrageously that those who would, quote, assist in advertising were historians William Kelleher and Philip J. Rash and movie cowboy Gene Autry. Years later, soon before his death, Morrison wrote a March 28, 1977 letter to Sonishin showing how high the two fakers had aimed. Morrison reminisced, your letter of February 3, 1954, to me in Los Angeles aroused fond memories. You heard from your agent and wanted me to have this information prior to my meeting with Gene Autry and Howard Hughes. 
we refuse to accept the first contract submitted on alias Billy the Kid by UNM Press, urging additional clauses regarding cancellation and subsidiary rights. I was still negotiating with Autry on television rights and averse to sharing the profits. Unsurprisingly, alias Billy the Kid, released in 1955, was dismissed by historians. So, unsurprisingly, Morrison attacked. To historian Philip J. Rash, he angrily growled on June 1, 1955, most of the experts have a closed mind. In a June 5, 1955 letter to New Mexico Magazine editor George Fitzpatrick, Morrison proclaimed, I have made my case and it is up to them to bring in their evidence to disqualify my contentions. The salesman in him knew that this handful of people constituted no market for a book. The market was a vast public whose ignorance about Billy the Kid could be counted on and whose gullibility could be hoped for. Did Morrison know he was selling lies? Strangely, sociopaths don't think about that. Their lack of conscience leaves cheating just a good way to win, and winning is their sole objective. William V. Morrison died on August 30th, 1977. His September 9th, 1977 El Paso Herald Post obituary stated, he was a resident of El Paso for 29 years. He had been associated in the George Hervey Real Estate Company and in Cardin Real Estate Company for many years. He was also a retired bankruptcy referee. Mr. Morrison was also a member of the historical societies in Missouri, Illinois, and El Paso. Omitted was Billy the Kid. But to the present, William V. Morrison is idolized by Brushy Bill's duped believers. The next talk will complete the triumvirate of Brushy Bill, Billy the Kid imposter, hoaxers, by adding alias Billy the Kid's author, Charles Leland Sonishin, to Oliver Brushy Bill Roberts, and William V. Morrison.